Please welcome to the stage, Commander J.P. Cretien. Welcome back. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Borden. Uh, Dave is a principal investigator in our BG Plus program. BG is for bridging the gap, and the gap is a serious injury to the spinal cord that completely disrupts the flow of neural information. So people with this injury have no sensory or motor function below the injury. Anyone can sustain a serious spinal cord injury, but it is more prevalent in military and veteran populations. And as you can imagine, it is devastating and profoundly life-altering. Dave and his team are working on a revolutionary solution to this problem. So please join me in welcoming Dave Borton. All right, thank you, JP, for that introduction. And really, it's truly a pleasure to be here to describe to you what we're doing to help our wounded warriors. We you are building something called the Intelligent Spine Interface, and that is to bridge the gap in spinal cord injury. I'm going to start with a video that gives a good introduction to this project and the team that we put together to solve this problem. The brain is a computer that runs the body. The spinal cord is the main electrical cable that connects that brain, that computer, to the rest of the body. Similarly, it carries electrical signals from the different parts of the body back to the brain to interpret. Trying to treat a patient who had a spinal cord injury, the signals that are generated from the brain that we typically send to the muscles and the legs and the arms are not able to get through the area of injury. So that function is completely lost in a patient with paraplegia or quadriplegia, for example. The Intelligent Spine Interface, or ISI, is the fusion between neurotechnology and spinal cord neuroscience. It's a spinal cord machine interface that we're developing to allow us to help patients with spinal cord injury. The hope is that it enables them to walk and to use different body functions again. In the spinal cord that's injured, there's a break in the spinal cord. We're attempting to bridge the gap of injury. How this intelligent spine interface works is to be sensing the signals that are coming up, say, from your toe, up to the electrode array that is sitting below the injury. To take those signals out of the body that's going to a computer where it's being interpreted, outputs of that get sent back into the spinal cord to the other electrode array, and those signals then propagate up to the person's brain. What we're gonna do in this current study is run machine learning methodologies to interpret how these signals relate to important activities of daily living for each participant. It's a much more computational understanding of the brain what's really going on with those neural networks. Can we create a better understanding of what it is that we're dealing with other than this is injured tissue? Our team consists of engineers, neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, rehabilitation specialists, and physical therapists. Machine learning specialists in the computer vision space. We work with Carney Institute at Brown University. The School of Engineering at Brown University. It includes corporate partners, Intel Corporation, Microleads Medical, and Modular Bionics. This project was originally supported by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, as well as the Veterans Administration. And the hope is that this will translate into a widespread clinical tool that clinicians can give to patients. We have the facilities, we have the depth of science, we have the world's experts here, and we are very excited that this project has the potential to take our research to the next level. All right. So, how is spinal cord injury treated today? Well, it's done through decompression, mechanical solutions that put a rod and screws into your spine to stabilize it physically and to allow for a pressure to be relieved. That's all we can do today. There is some research going on about motor reactivation by activating circuits below the lesion site, but what I'm talking about today is really a jump in what we can accomplish, which is bridging the gap. This is an electrical interface, a functional interface between above the lesion and below the lesion to send signals back and forth through machine learning interpretations. So what do we need to do to do this? Well, we have to develop a high density interface to the spinal cord that can both listen and write into the spinal cord itself. We have to develop neuromodulation tools that are good for sensory replacement as well as motor activation. 
And we need to make sure this system is bi-directional, meaning we're recording signals, being able to put them into some other external box, or maybe one day an implanted box that is a computational module, able to interpret and then put command signals back out again. That's our challenge. Again, as mentioned in the video, it's an enormous team of industry partners, academic institutions, clinicians, uh, and really a wonderful group of, of people. So I'm going to jump right into uh, what we're lo looking at with our first participant we've done in this study. So on the left, you see that the participant had a complete spinal cord injury. This is from a very severe boating accident where their spine was severed completely in half. What our system does or looks like is here it's the, on the right side of the, of the, the uh, page, which is an electrode array placed above the lesion site and an electrode array placed below the lesion site, bridging that gap. You see it here implanted uh, in this participant. So I want to jump right into what were the things we could do with this type of implant and using this technology, since this is a demo session. Um, not advancing. There we go. OK, so the first video I'm going to show you um, is a person who has spinal cord injury, the same person we just saw. And we are now stimulating their spinal cord above their lesion site. This person, again, because they have a complete injury, cannot feel anything below their waist and cannot see what's going on. They're, they're blindfolded to this. And she is reporting with her left and right hand which leg is being moved and what the angle of that knee joint is. Notice she's doing this with both of the legs, so both hands at the same time. We are providing that stimulation in real time. There was no training involved in this by the participant. They're immediately able to interpret that signal. Well, in this case, it doesn't feel like their knee. It feels like a replacement of stimulation, so they're mapping that internally in their brain. But still, they're immediately able to use that signal functionally, which is pretty wonderful. So then we decided uh, we would give the participant control of the stimulation itself. You might think, you know, as an engineer, we go through and we try to probe this huge parameter space of stimulation on this uh, pulse width or that frequency or this amplitude. It takes us a long time to actually find the optimal parameters in that space. If we give these controls to a participant, they can find that optimal pr uh, parameter within 10 seconds, 20 seconds. That's hugely important when we think about there are machine learning models behind all this, mapping the, the stimulation to actual output, whether that's a perception or a, a leg movement. Um, those models are static today. We want those to learn over time. How are we going to train those models? We need input from the participant to give the context of what is good and what is bad. So we've been exploring that in this study, and it's been, we think that's going to be a huge help as we move forward in this program. Um, now, what's also most important to think about is what is the participant's perspective of using this new technology? So I'll go through a series of videos here with the time remaining to talk about some of those. So here she is describing control of her stimulation uh, on her own. Or the DJ experiment. That was really cool. Yeah. I liked that because, you know, I could really tell what was, I, I could kind of figure out what you guys were stimulating and how you were stimulating it. And I could manipulate them to do what I wanted them to do. So that was fun, being in control of it and seeing how the stimulation worked. So, so do you think being in control of something like an array for daily life and kind of figure, you know, kind of programming for today, you're going to, Feel this if I do that, would that be something you find helpful? Or? I definitely think so, especially if you know I could get really good at them and get my legs to move in a certain way, or like, because I know I could get you know like my hip to jump versus my toe to move, but like if you could get them to move in a helpful way, like even just like standing up for a second, I don't know, that could be really helpful. All right, so the next video I'm going to show is about her interpretation of how she could use this sensation control in her daily lives. Do you feel that, that those sorts of sensation, would those be helpful for you in your daily life? So, I think once, you know, we were doing the things with like the ankles and knees just now where I could tell, you know, whether it was flexed up or pointed down, which side it was, I think that could be really helpful because the more... Like, obviously, it didn't feel like my feet were moving. I just felt the feedback. But the more I like, felt it, the better I could tell, OK, my, my, I know that's a pointed left foot, or I know that's a flexed right foot. All right, let's see here. Click. Yeah. I'm going to skip that video because of time. Um, I want to well, give you perspective about their motivation after, their, uh, after the study and how this, what the study meant to this participant. Um, I think it's a really important part of this, of this work. So here, I'll play that video again, if it goes. There we go. I'm not applying to grad school at Brown <laughs> so I can come join you guys. No, um, I don't know. I feel like everything we did here was super cool. I, I, 
I don't know. I feel like I want to come back and do this stuff. And so not only are we building new technologies to advance how we can communicate with the spinal cord, these tools are built in a way that are motivating to participants and eventual patients who have these implanted in them. Uh, I do want to show a final slide here of sort of a big picture, which uh, is, I think, not showing up right now. There it goes. Great. So a big picture of what we're doing here. This is uh, our system, again, building a bidirectional system into the nervous system. We are doing that through a leap in our technology space. So we built uh, electrode arrays that interface with the spinal cord that I can show you here that have, this is the state of the art today, which is a 32 channel system from Boston Scientific. It has four big pigtails coming out the back of it. Our new HD64 system has an ASIC built onto it, which is a multiplexer, allowing us to connect to, right now, 64 channels, but that system will scale to many more numbers and only has two wires coming out of it, or two cables. That's really important as we try to build towards the next generation interfaces to the nervous system. And with that, I think I'll thank the, my entire team for all this work, and I'll, I'll end there. So thank you very much for listening.